Okay, great. Okay. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Caitlin Carnes. I'm the Administrative Coordinator at the Arts Council Windsor and Region. I'm very honored to be working in this community and on this territory. I would like to thank our funders, Ontario Arts Council, the City of Windsor, and I would like to thank our members for their endless support and the Windsor Essex Community Foundation for making this program possible. Uh, now I would like to do some land acknowledgements. So first, the original caretakers of this land, the indigenous peoples lived and thrived prior to colonization. In that regard, I acknowledge the three fires confederacies of First Nations comprised of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, Ottawa and the Potawatomi. As part of ongoing structures of allyship, I work to ensure that space is given to Indigenous cultural perspectives and that these perspectives are respected. These lands, what settlers, colonists named Windsor, is connected with the Treaty 2, the McKee Purchase of 1790, and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wapum. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, newcomers in this generation or generations past. Today, we acknowledge those of us who came here forcibly, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. We acknowledge the grave harm that colonialism brought to these lands, in particular, the erasure of African identities. Today, we also recognize, honor, and pay tribute to the ancestors of African origin and descent. Their labor, bravery, and contributions are integral to Canada's diverse and rich history. So welcome to Making Space. Uh, Making Space is to amplify the voices of artists and makers and to practice allyship and to create a critical mass and mentorship structure through the supports uh, of the needs of artists. COVID-19 has allowed the community to stop, reflect and learn about allyship and learn from our black colleagues. However, this has had a negative impact and emotional toll on all of our colleagues having to teach and continually educate on racism. Making space is an opportunity for the Black community to be able to have support and to be able to speak in a safe space. Today's panel discussion is called How to Talk About Anti-Black Racism. Now, I would like to introduce you to our panelists and our moderator. Our first panelist is Dr. Natalie Delia Deckard, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminology at the University of Windsor. Next, we have Josh Lemaires, who is a second year law student and is currently a research student and former social justice fellow at the Black Legal Action Center with his master's and bachelor social work from Ryerson University. And finally, we have Kamisha Siblis, who is an assistant professor at the University of Windsor in the School of Social Work. And tonight's moderator is Talisha Bujold Abu, who is an artist, illustrator, researcher, and arts facilitator. Um, we do have a Q&A option available, uh, so just please ask your questions through the Q&A function on Zoom, um, and we will go through those at the end of our discussion. So now I would like to turn it over to Talisha. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm really excited to have these astounding voices and minds in the same room. As moderator, I'm here to facilitate and help in our sharing. And I'd like to start us off with the first question. How do we define anti-Black racism? So <clears throat> anti-Black racism is uh, a term specifically used in the Canadian context. It was uh, first, as we, we know, it was first uh, expressed by Dr. Akua Benjamin at, uh, at Ryerson. And it really is a way to, um, to name the, the particular prejudice, uh, discrimination, um, you know, attitudes and beliefs against black people or people of, of sub-Saharan African de descent um, based on our that Canada's history of, of colonization and enslavement and its uh, exploitation of, of Black people. Building off of what Kamisha is saying, this, this idea that, that 
racism is is the term that we use and everyone can be racist and this sounds racist and this is a racist action and it's all very um confusing and nuanced the the term anti-black racism calls that idea out okay? the idea very specifically unavoidably and it's impossible to rhetorically get around is that when we talk about anti-black racism we are talking about violence done against black people for their blackness um, rarely, I think, right, does the term have that much power? And anti-Black racism really does. Like, it hits that nail on the head. And it also means that we're called out as Black people for what was called colorism, but is anti-Black racism without losing track of the white supremacist structure in which Black people suffer. And ultimately, that's why we're all here, right? Absolutely. I think it also really it, it also names specifically um, the fact that anti blackness undergirds all other types of racism and discrimination, right? So it really it really names a fundamental um, part of 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 the structure of of oppression of peoples, um, and so anti blackness is sort of embedded in all the other racisms as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, looping to what you were saying, Kamisha, with respect to Dr. Kula Benjamin, at the time that Dr. Kula Benjamin um, did the interview where, you know, she named anti-Black racism for the public, um, was at the same time that the Young Street riots occurred. And so I think one of the things that gets lost in you know, even arguably the naming of this panel is like the how to talk, right? Which is, you know, anti-Black racism um, in terms of a directional naming to direct community to see from a vantage point that Black people are dying again and again. And as Dr. Ronaldo Walcott says, Black people are always dying in very different ways fundamentally from everyone else. Um, and that the, the frame of reference and perspective from Black people is always from the framing of death, not about <clears throat> our soon-to-be deaths, but that our daily lives are wrapped up in death. And therefore, our politics of life and living um, are fundamental to that. And so that in 1992, when, when anti-Black racism is intervening and jettisoned uh, into the public conversation, you know, a lot of being in law school, white people love to applaud Stephen Lewis as if though he was the one, um, you know, in his report to name anti-Black racism. It wasn't this white man. It came out of not just, you know, a Black woman being in front of a camera. It was a Black woman who was working alongside other Black people organizing in response to these daily Black deaths. And so for folks who you know, and I'm sure we all experience it, especially in this, the, 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 the space of the economy, just kind of this like, this weird comfort to be like, oh, we know anti-Black racism is real. And we're like, you're very comfortable with saying that. Do you understand that this is about the death making and deathly practices that are a part of our daily lives, right? And and how we are fundamentally having to, to challenge that in our daily lives in the ways that we can. Um, and, and I think that's a, like, for folks who are listening, I think that's an important thing to understand that like really, I, I personally am not here and I'm sure the other panelists are not here to like ensure that you can go home and you know, when Easter comes up, you're able to talk about anti-Black racism the best out of your family. No, we're trying to have you understand that this, that this frame of reference, this, this, this intervention into public discourse, which at the same time, you know, as Natalie was saying, to name anti-Black racism you know, of course, there were non-Black racialized people who were like, well, what do you mean anti-Black racism? We all have the same experience, you know? I, we, need, we need to stand together, right? To, because non-Black people did not want to be implicated. And so it's really about, you know, the naming and framing of anti-Black racism in an ethical, rigorous way, understanding that I don't care about what, frankly, I really don't care what your Easter conversations look like. I care about the days that Black people can wake up and we don't have a litany of lists in our head about how to survive and who also died that day. That for me is kind of like the feeling of addressing anti-Black racism and therefore how we name it. Thank you. Oh, Natalie, would you like to? 
I, Josh saying the ways in which blackness and death become constructed as synonymous in the same sent me on this entire mental thought process around the ways that we value life solely in proximity to whiteness and demonstrated proximity to whiteness. Like this whole conversation about like no angel and then on the other hand, honorable student, excellent font, all of these imagined deeply imbued in white supremacy ideas right, of what constitutes deservingness. The way that as a black person only through distance from blackness can the, the right to continue life be established? That black racism is, is the creation of that synonymity. Um, I just, yeah, I thought that that was a really important point. I'd like to follow this up then by asking, how do we hold space for these conversations? Especially in this idea of constructing panel that Josh had touched on, and thank you for that. It's where are we finding, um, real space to kind of connect and what does that actually mean for those that are involved? I mean, we're all tired, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And, and I think, you know, from an organizing perspective and from, from a historical perspective, like, you know, white, specifically the white labor movement seems to think that they were the first kind of group to interact with this refusal of the right of assembly, as if though black people were not legislated to not assemble and come together and connect, right? Um, and I'm currently in a labor class where I, I bang my head against the wall almost every other day when I have to read the readings and go through the lecture. Um, and so connectivity coming together, we, and to be clear, we have always refused and come together, but that is not to say it's not fraught with, with many things, including, you know, um, the state always trying to intercept, intervene, you know, interweave themselves within um, the state offering crumbs to certain individuals and how that plays out in terms of colorism and shadism, but also blacks as heteropatriarchy, um, you know, the ways in which the state designates certain kind of black behaviors as you know pathological criminal and then therefore how that plays out in community who gets criminalized who gets pathologized who gets institutionalized um and so it is it is i will say as an organizer it is truly difficult to have people to come together ethically I can bring a room full of folks together, sure, but I don't know if I can if I can say that that at the ethics of an ethical politics of life, as Dr. Ronaldo Walcott calls it, as Dr. Ronaldo Walcott and Adil Abdullahi talk about it in their book. I, I cannot say that a black space necessarily gets to, is operating on an ethical politics of life because of these different dynamics of of what impedes that space, what gets brought into that space, um, and how people want to address that, if at all. Um, it's very difficult. And then at the same time, kind of why we're here, we leave that space and we've got some Becky, Sarah, Amy being like, oh my God, I want to be an ally. How can I be there for you? Right? Like the, the, there's, there's different kind of encumbrances on us all the time. And that's why and you talk to any Black person or you read any Black writing, ideas of breath and breathing always comes up, both metaphorically and literally. And I think that's a very there's a reason for that. Um, and I think it has to do with the fact that community and connectivity is, is, is made difficult by how anti-Blackness and its multiple ways that it lives encumbers Black lives. In terms of ethical organizing and um, panels in general, right? The idea that blackness is monolithic is, is untrue. Right? Also, politically, blackness is monolithic. Black lives matter, making distinctions between what types of black lives matter in what and to what purpose is almost always anti-black, right? We hold this duality constantly. Trying to think through what an ethical panel looks like, right? Um, I think that the intentionality that you brought to thinking through what the Black diaspora is, right, what that means, 
happen. No one will ever hit any nail on the head. But the Arts Council did, I, I want you guys to work through this, right? I want to visualize that because that's important, right? Um, the idea that you're not telling, but rather collaborating. You're not teaching, but rather learning. And to the extent that we can stop using ally as a noun and rather think of it as a verb, I think that y'all are doing that. Um, I, I haven't answered a question in 10 years, right? I have no answers. I, I wish that I was 25 again. I knew a ton of stuff then. I, I don't know what happened to any of it. But thinking through what ethical organizing and panel making and who has voice, this idea that, that breath is connected with voice. Um, I think that just, just by problematizing it, there's some proportion of the way there. And that's what's real. Um, so if I could answer the question in one word, it would be carefully, right? How do we create space? Carefully. I think there is a lot of doing and undoing in, in panels and in spaces where we talk about, about Blackness. And there is a lot that we all who have embodied experience leave on the floor um, when we are creating these spaces. It is always, these spaces are always um, sort of in, imbued with, with, with our blood, right? Or just, just because to speak about anti-Blackness, as Josh said, is to speak about, is to speak about um, Black death, right? Black life is synonymous with Black death. We're always, and Christina Sharp talks about living in the wake, right? We are always living in the wake of death. We're always living in the expectancy of death. We are always speaking um, our truths as a matter of survival. Everything that we do is about our survival. Um, and so when I think about creating space, um, you know, Josh, Josh men mentions, you know, the Beckys that be like, oh my, the, the, oh my God, I really want to help. It's just really important that people understand that we, none of us do this lightly, um, that these spaces as much as we are trying to speak life, we are speaking death, we are speaking in the absolution of our, of our extermination constantly, constantly, and our denial as well. Um, so, and then there, there is this, there is this duality in within us because we uh, our activism and our and our and our organizing is of course to perpetuate life and to sort of reify these experiences and to teach but it also is our labor and it's also um for me it also becomes with this a uh, distru distrust of who's consuming it right because it feels like voyeurism at the same time um and it really does feel like our souls and our lives are on display and not unlike they've always been throughout time immemorial um, with very little change, with very little influence. And so when I say, when we talk about creating space, I say carefully, I say, you know, just understanding the depth of, of what is happening, what is being done and being undone every single time we come together to do things like this. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when you said that, when you said carefully, it brought up something in my head respect to when I, especially when I'm like, you know, uh, teaching like new organizers, black organizers specifically, um, and including when we do solidarity work on creating a space or writing, right? Because creating space is not just always the physical space where we, we get to commune physically, right? Like reading in its own way is a kind of commune. Um, and Bell Hooks talks about that. Um, <clears throat> and so one of the things I always say to people is I can tell when the audience is meant for white people and, you, uh, and that's who you're talking to, that's who you're writing for, and you're going to have a problem. And I can tell I can tell when you're trying, when you're when you're actually censoring black people, when you're actually trying to be an audience with and in conversation with black people. And of course, 
there is the questions of which kind of black people, of course, you know, are they the uh, the the black capitalist, elitist, you know, um, so on and so forth. Um, and through that framing, you know, especially when I when I'm talking to organizers, because especially as an organizer, you run into people being like, well, aren't you supposed to teach the white people to get them on board? And I'm like, frankly, no, I'm more concerned about making sure that black folks share this vantage point or understand this vantage point, that we hear this vantage point or that I am hearing someone else's vantage point that I did not see and that I understand that vantage point. Why? Because we are dying and trying to live. And so, you know, an example in the, in, you know, if they're attending, then they're attending, um, is in the law school where there is like this like anti-black racism and allyship panel. And, um, I was invited to be on the panel and when I actually ended up seeing the makeup leading up to, I was like, oh, absolutely not because there's white people on the panel. It's centering allyship. I personally actually don't believe in allyship, right? It's still, allyship's not actually like, if we try to trace it back, it's really not a framing that was really made by us. You know, if we continue to run into like this dead end with allyship. Um, and, you know, I think there's reasons for that. And I think it's okay to say that there are there are there are if black people are dying, we can say there are dead constructs and move on. Um, and you know, it was just it, and from what I heard that came out of that space is exactly what I knew was going to be that space, and how I was talked to about that space. Oh well, we need to make sure that the white men. We have to remember that predominantly the the law students are white men. I'm like, I, I don't need to remember that. I haven't forgotten it. They're the ones that are they're harassing me in my in my DMs. What you mean, right? And so this is, it's really, a, I think a creating space is really being like, who am I actually trying to have conversation with? Who do I actually understand as an audience? Because often that's where you actually end up in ethical answers and questions as well. I think it's really important to state that there is funding for this event as there should be. This is not charity. Right. This is not pro bono work that I am yet again expected to engage in a hot mess of caretaking to make sure that everybody feels real comfortable because, I mean, look at me, I'm the nanny. I'm the mammy all the time. Right. To the degree right, that um, we want to have these conversations and the expectation is that I enact a ton of labor right, for free for the benefit of others while I explain to them slowly, carefully, and for the billionth time why they should stop oppressing me and mine, that's, I can't, I, I, I can't anymore. No, I don't wanna say I can't, I won't anymore. I, I just won't do it. When we're talking about collaborating among my community, right? The people that, that come one step after me, right? And have walked one step in front of me, right? Absolutely, totally. When we talk about um, educational spaces, right, so that, 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 that people can virtue signal better, right, or to be fair, be better. Okay? It, it's not, it's not charity. And I, I think that that, that's part of the, the original answer. Um, how, how are we ethical in panels versus organizing, right, and all those different spaces. Um, Do we have any further thoughts before moving on to the next question? Okay. I, I feel like it's been touched upon and I wanna frame this question carefully because um, when we bring up topics of emotional labor, labor, a lot of those spaces are suggesting that black people share their trauma and that that is the clearest example of emotional labor. So when I say, how do we navigate emotional labor within anti-black racism discussions and research? I'm, I want to I want to definitely frame this as no, this is not a space where we're trying to present black trauma um, as a tool for talking about empathy, and that I'd like to hear your thoughtful accounts of where emotional labor sits in this discussion. First, I have a hard and fast rule. I'm also an educator, so that's that's my full time job. 100% um, rule of uh, black students are not allowed to talk about trauma to educate white students in the classrooms. This is not a classroom setting. Right? 
but that 100% rule guides my entire thought process about this question. Um, somewhere along the line, uh, we were talking about pictures of traumatic, violent events, right? And the ways in which disasters that occurred in the global South were publicized and, and bodies were published. But for some unknown reason, when the victims are white people, we don't need any of those images to feel empathy. We feel empathy, right? Because we are not sociopaths. Who is the we that I am using right now? The idea that I need to bleed for you in order to gain not even your respect, right? but the basic acknowledgement of my underlying humanity. I don't need you to like me, but my humanity is something that it's not just that I resent. I feel like even if I were to consider engaging in that, then I'm actually doing violence to a whole bunch of people that come after me because then other women who look like me are expected to do the same 15 years from now. I won't do that to them. Um, at what point I gain a reputation for hostility? I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, no. My news for you is that you can't escape the reputation of hostility anyway. So it's pre-applied, right? So don't worry about it. Um, the emotional labor piece, you know, um, that Natalie said we have to bleed for, for us to get a little bit of empathy. And I don't feel, again, like I mentioned this before, I don't feel like we actually do glean the empathy even when we, when we, when we bleed. Um, we've seen, we've seen the, the photos of the lynch mobs and, and the white folks looking on in amusement. Um, and I don't know that it's any different now. Uh, I think that there is a, uh, a, there's a collective consciousness whereby, particularly in Canada, where we're supposed to be empathic and nice and good people. Um, but the, the fact that we are still treated the way that we are here, um, the fact that our progress is still being blocked explicitly, implicitly in very sophisticated ways through various technologies, uh, really negates that there's any, in, uh, there's any real empathy when we bleed. Um, it's, it's, it's amusement, it's entertainment, and so, I am extremely reluctant to, to put black pain on display, um, feeling like I'm going to gain allies, right? And, and I too, I, I'm with you, Josh, where, where, al where allies sit. I think that uh, the, the very way that allyship is constructed means that, that there's a dichotomy between us and you and we're, we're not you so we can help you. And it just, it, it re-entrenches. Um, the, the binaries between worthy and not worthy. And, uh, and so I'm not a fan, but um, the emotional labor is there anyway, right? I, we spoke about, you know, just talking and, and, and really bearing our souls either way. And regardless of how casually we're speaking about this, we are speaking about our lives and our experiences and the lives of our children and the, the lives of our ancestors and our, um, and, and our very existence um, as a people. And it's touchy, it's extremely touchy. Um, and we, are, we know that we are always speaking to people who are in denial, who will negate our experiences regardless of, of what color and shade they are, because as Josh mentioned, we are, we, you know, we are in the company of many capitalist and neoliberal folks that feel like we need to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and that systemic barriers don't really exist. Um, and, and really buy into meritocracy, right? So, um, so the black labor is there. Uh, how do you manage it? It's, 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 it's pain management, right? We're, we're talking strictly about pain management. We, we build our communities, we, you know, we, and we try 
as much as we can to be around people who restore us at the end of the day, because we just have to acknowledge that it's always going to be there. And it'd be great if our audiences and, and uh, you know, the people who might be reading the research or, um, or whatever it is that we, whatever our, our output is would, would acknowledge that too. Right. Um, so I know I do research on, on my, my own people. Right. And so in order to like, so I, in acknowledging the black labor, you know, Natalie said she doesn't do it for free. I don't expect anybody that I ever work with to do it for free. Um, and I try to treat people, I think the notion of, of humans and humanism is problematic, but I try to treat them as more, as more worthy and with more value than they've probably ever been treated through whatever it is that I've, that I've worked with them through and I and, um, and acknowledge, acknowledge the pain. So. Yeah, for this, I'm like, I'm I, so I have notes. Also, if folks are watching and you see me like moving around. I recently had a surgery on my shoulder. It doesn't look it because, you know, we're insured, but that's why I shift. Um, <laughs> um, so I kind of, I almost want to, uh, so I, cause Christina Sharp's been brought up and, you know, for folks who, and, and this is how, why I get frustrated with people who say like, make really interesting refusals to read. Reading Christina Sharp's In the Wake fundamentally shifted how I understood doing care work as an organizer, um, as someone in social work, as someone writing, as someone who's done research, particularly in the realm of child welfare, where people love to use Black child welfare survivors for whatever means necessary. Um, and so it fundamentally shifted what narratives I say, how I understand the atmosphere with respect to Black life, how I, how I understand the ground in which we walk upon. Um, and so with that, you know, um, <sighs> I think I, I do, I think there's always though a distinction between emotional labor and emotional dumping. And I say that because particularly as black women in this space, black, a black queer person, black trans people, it always takes emotional labor to be in a space and do a specific thing. But there are people that are doing emotional labor, right? Where we're the ones who, who get the call between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. with respect to someone else's crisis in life. And we're dealing with that emotional labor and holding that story. We're the we're actually the one who like we're more consistently the ones who when we're walking through the hallway, um, someone is coming to us with crises. Like right, I make a joke about how I can never just walk straight to the bathroom. There's always something that comes up. There's always someone else's crises that comes up, um, and I think and 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 again that looks that looks in very different ways. Again, it, it has to do again with understanding of particularly feminized labor and then feminized people. Um, and I think that's important because I do think there are certain ways in which I have experienced people who can kind of, who who think there's an expectation, especially when it comes to black cis heteropatriarchy, that they can emotionally dump. And so you see what it looks like to make refusals as a black, uh, as a black woman or black queer or trans person um, to, to say no, right? Um, and so, and I think that that, that is it. I, I, I tread lightly knowing that the, the, knowing the audience is mixed and I don't need a bunch of people up in people's business, but I think that's an important distinction because when we bring that back and it, it, like looping to the conversation about a panel, you know, there are like some of us have very interesting days and some of us really don't, right? And so when we come to do these spaces, we're making refusals regarding emotional labor for certain individuals in certain spaces because of the ways in which in our own community we do emotional labor. And in some ways we are kind of non-consensually pushed to do emotionally labor. Um, and, and then if we say no to that, then the ways in which that, then we get re-narrated or narrated. Um, and so it's funny, you know, when you talk about hostility, you know, as a black child welfare survivor, uh, you know, interesting upbringing with respect to ideas of emotions and emotional labor. Um, and, you know, in my head, and, and I, I lean very much on, um, on um, Catherine McKittrick and Sylvia Winter, um, who, who leans on Sylvia Winter uh, with demonic grounds. And I, and I, I, you know, I'm currently working on something uh, called demonic utterances. 
because like, you know, excuse my language, but it just doesn't fucking matter what I say and do. Someone's always going to have a problem. I'm all, like, you know, the, 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 the slippage from hostile to, to, and I, you know, folks have probably seen my open letter to as a black queer man, bitch, you know, the anti-black uh, sanism that gets woven into the ways in which I'm language, everything I do is demonic, right? And so I'm not actually going to do the emotional labor to talk my way out of that or to move or embody my way out of that because something about being demonic um, to whomever that is upon like across you, something about being demonic does something different for me and my community. By being demonic, I've been able to think and organize and yes, and hold space with and connect with, right? Where, you know, it's not just me with my demonic audiences. There's a there's a chorus of us, right? The, the law school is experiencing that. Um, and so, the, the, so there's a connection there with the emotional labor because it is emotional labor to try to weave your way into neoliberalism and out of the demonic. Uh, that has been cast upon us, and and through and that plays out in your research, right? Like when I did research on uh, with Black Child Survivors, the pro like I had to make my own methodology because the, the that which was taught me to me was too white and not good enough for me, and so I made my I, I my my research had to be two things: making the methodology, using it to then look at what is resistance for Black Child Survivors. And the research ethics board for folks who are listening, that's a body that gets to approve if you get to do your research. They couldn't understand it. Like they, they were like, they, they had no problem with it. They just kept being like, but why do you care? They're like, you don't have to do that much, right? The, the idea that I would do more than what is required for black people, right? In a sense, they're like, it's demonic. It's excess from what they consider to be the human requirement for the REB engaging people. Um, and so that links to what Kamisha just said. And, you know, Sylvia Winter, many people talk about the fact that this construct of human is not serving anybody. Um, and so by being demonic and refusing emotional labor also, it undoes the institutional tactics. Um, and and, and I, I, I push back and I talk to many people who think, you know, oh, we should have a listening space or the university wants to have a listening space or we should go to the board meeting. And I say, no, 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 no. They have enough data. Right, they, what, what's gonna happen is you're gonna go and you're actually gonna do emotional labor and also emotionally dump and experience catharsis. They want you to, they want you to talk your story out of yourself and then leave that space and think the work is done. They have my story, these people care, right? And so by refusing things around emotional labor, by again, remaining in, in the demonic um, and refusing certain utterances, that which you say later in a strategic way is a hell of a lot more demonic and has a much more impact. And we, again, we see that play at the, at the university. The University of Windsor thought, okay, well, we're gonna have this task force and we're just gonna give you recommendations in fall 2021. And some of us said that's absolutely not good enough. And we, we kept on the demonic utterances. We were in the media, we were on Twitter, some of us were on LinkedIn, da, da, da. and then suddenly many things start to unfold in the university, which it never announced beforehand, right? And I, and I think that's kind of what shows um, again, looping to emotional labor and, or, and, and as a particular, I will say, is a particular kind of uh, refusal from a black feminist space. Because as a black law student in a certain kind of space, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of like cishet black men saying, let's go to the meeting. And I'm like, no, no, I'm actually trying to watch Netflix and eat my dinner, go to what meeting, why? Why? Well, because they told us to. Uh, don't don't you care about black people? Isn't this how we get our get our thing? I'm like, go go read the report from 2003 and let me know if this will work. Oh, but this time, this time, right? This time we have enough proof. We have enough data. And again, looping to COVID-19, we have more than enough data. Does our government care about black racialized indigenous people with respect to this vaccine or dealing with certain measures? No, data doesn't serve us. Again, this is all about emotional labor. And it's again, about the ethical politics of life. And for me, remaining in the demonic has been the way I've been able to be ethical. I think there's some utility to rejecting the idea that talk among friends, that support among loved ones, that being in community and being responsible to and obligated to the people who are, who are obligated to you. Uh, at, like I, I was experimenting with calling friends social capital because that's basic sociological, right? Your friends are, and at some point, I think it was during the, the emotional labor um, conversation maybe like a year ago, I was like, no, 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 these are not social capital. 
no, 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 right? When I'm talking to my friends, right? That That's, yes, I mean, it requires me to be present. Yes, sometimes I'm tired, right? Yes, I guess that this is laborious, right? But it's not actually emotional labor. That's something that I do for an institution. That's something that I do for white people. Um, I'm trying to disentangle that in my head because I can still resent my friends and loved ones because it's 2 a.m. and we've discussed this for some amount of time now, but it's, I, I, I don't think that it's actually the same thing. And as I started to disentangle that just for myself, it helped me to drop their boundaries. Because I didn't want to draw boundaries in community. Like, I actually don't. Like, I, I'm good with where that's at. But I want to draw really strict boundaries around what is actual labor. And to the extent that McDonald's pays its workers for smiling when they say, do you want fries with that? Right. That's emotional labor. They shouldn't have to smile. Do you want fries? Like, why, why is that a thing? Um, that's all I'm doing at the institutional level. I'm saying there needs to be equity. And they're expecting me to smile with them. That's the emotional labor that I'm trying to get to the bottom of. And that's the emotional labor. I'm trying to not, Dr. to your point about this is the 50 millionth iterate, iteration of task force report. Can we not? Like, just, just not. I don't, I think that that's emotional labor. And I'm unwilling to engage in it, certainly not for free, because that, it's actual work. Um, yeah, to some extent, I think we're buying into a, a, a neoliberal framework, right? When we're categorizing and commodifying, right? especially if we conflate what we do as people with what we do as cogs in terms of capitalism. I think that just, just existing within all of these various institutions and frameworks is work. It's work for us. It's not, they, we are always pushing against the current to be there just to just to exist there, right? And so, um, and we're always having to check our, our authentic selves and authentic experiences at the door when we do that so that we can make the, make our colleagues comfortable, make our, you know, make our, whoever's in our company comfortable. And it's all like, and that is the service with a smile, right? All of that checking at the door that we have to do, all of that, pretending that, you know, that we don't have a chip on our shoulder, right? Like that, 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 that we are living this in this e even playing field and we can be neutral and we can be objective, whatever that means. All of that um, takes a lot of suppression <laughs> and, and it's laborious and it's deadening. It's spirit deadening, right? So there really isn't any, and we're, and I mean, we do it for free a lot because what we gain from it is, is survival, right? That's it. To your point from earlier, right, when you were talking about the hostility, right, and to Josh's point about the demonic, I don't think we have a choice. I think that what happens if I speak out is that everybody's a little afraid of me because I'm so hostile and unpredictable. And if I don't speak out, then nobody's afraid of me and I get fired faster. I don't think that there's an actual choice there. You're right. And we, you and I have talked about the fact that when you speak out and when, and when I speak out, it's, it's taken up really differently too. And so there's, there's also that. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, and I think, you know, so there was, when you talked about suppression, I, like it, it's, you know, I was uh, just reading Ronaldo's new book on property and we talk, and it, you know, it keeps resurfacing on the amount of restraint that black people actually show. Restraint takes emotional energy, right? And I went, I said to my, I was saying to my friend, because I've been receiving some responses from individuals I speak better for, I expect better from, but, and I said to my friend, the way that people talk about me I just wish I was granted 24 hours to get to act like that. Just 24. Like whatever that movie was where they just, you know, an alarm goes off and Josh, you, you, all right, here we go. Ra -ta -ta -ta. <laughs> um, and restraint takes emotional energy. 
And the other thing is we like, you know, in this conversation, very thick layer is people have to, you know, remember anti-Black Satanism. And for folks who are listening, it's the, the particular pathologization of, of Black people as always mad. And then the way that through that construction of Black people as always mad, certain Black people are then psychiatrized. And then there are Black mad and psychiatrized. Black people's emotion, like no matter emotionality, Black emotionality is always pathologized, right? So you it, it, s s simply read um, how a Black person is described in distress and how they're responded to. Simply read how it, like, you know, how does, how does a six, six, seven-year-old Black girl end up chained to her desk in Peel region for a temper tantrum, right? Um, you know, how is it that just saying, hey, like this is anti-Black stop, ends up with a very certain kind of institutional response, depending, yes, on who you are, right? The hue of your skin, the gender you, 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 you are, right? Your sexual orientation, um, your, your publicly identified disability and madness, right? And so emotionality, it's, it's like to, to make certain emotional choices. And, you know, Natalie, when you were saying, I don't know if it's a choice, that's why I think it's Lisa Lowe who talks about like duress, right? We, li we live like, and it, for the law students listening, we know that a choice under duress is no choice at all, right? So if a choice under duress is no choice at all, then understand that black folks are making particular quote unquote decisions under duress, right? Always and forever. Now, of course, certain people are willing to make certain decisions under duress, internalizing the duress to benefit from the duress, right? And that's at a very important aspect. And we, we experience those people on campus, we experience those people in our meetings, we experience those people in our daily lives. And that makes that actually makes it more difficult, right? When we make the choice to speak at the duress, name the duress as anti-Black, for example, and organize against it. But again, remaining remaining kind of for me in the demonic and and and, and not doing the emotional labor to strip myself my way uh, myself away. I've been I, I say to because the students are always like, how do you organize the way that you do? And I'm just like, because I'm disrespectful. <laughs> like I I always tell people I or like they want me to organize from a space of respectability, then I'm gonna organize from disrespectability. Respectability, the institution makes the game board. White supremacy makes the game board. Anti-black racism makes the game board. Disrespectability is creative. That's why there's always artists in the movement right disrespectability means you sit in a room being like and, and the restraint you show is being like okay y'all that's maybe a little bit too much right like let's not do that but you know it's like when when i organize and it, it, it like and this is kind of shifts into and dion brand she says in, in in her book theory there are i believe it's there are no friends in academia there are only comrades and then i forget what the other word she used right so i'm building comrades in these spaces and when I organize from a space of disrespectability with other people, let me tell you, we are laughing our asses off about what we're about to do, right? Because it's disrespectful to the, the respect, respectable institution. And so there's different kind of offerings and choices that you're making under duress that frankly feel better. And I think that in itself is a kind of, I don't want to say emotional management, but it's kind of like an a, a, emotional honesty and affirming, right? Because you're like, we're laughing. And then we go and do this thing. And whether the institution listens to it or not, we were genuinely ourselves, right? We were we were genuinely disrespectful, right? Um, and and that, that does something. And I think that's, the, and I see some of the folks commenting saying, yes, we are, <laughs> um, right? And so I, I, I think that's, again, it's a black feminist praxis and it, and it gets to, if they're going to call us chaotic and black and mad, it gets to sit in whatever this black madness is for them. We get to sit in it and not pathologize it and instead embody this, this quote unquote thing, I guess, and be, be this thing and organize and speak and act differently. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, that barely covers how to respond to that because I mean, I feel like the silence is the awe. <laughs> so thank you, really. I mean, more than that. Um, we've, we're obviously reaching close to 8 p.m. And I'd like to take this opportunity to open up questions to our audience, which can be communicated through the Q&A section. Um, with respect to our panel, if these questions are inappropriate, they will not be voiced. And if they do not have any bearing on what we've communicated today, they will also not be voiced or read.
so far we have one question and to the panel we can decide to not answer if we're not interested. When discussing the roots of anti-Black racism here in Canada, do you think it's important to weave in the history of slavery in Canada? If so, how do you suggest navigating this conversation while also creating space for the trauma of slavery? Um, I'll, I'll go for like two minutes. Uh, I think that the Canadians are super invested in the idea that Americans are American and Canadians are Canadian and we are somehow post-British colonialism, which is imagined as something that doesn't have enslavement at its, at its center. And the entire rest of America, which somehow ends at the US-Canadian border, despite geography and the map, uh, is, is an American story, which has nothing to do with us. Um, this, this to me becomes particularly irksome in a bunch of different ways. Even the fact that, that you don't say people in the US, you say Americans, right? Like they're to separate. Like at the level of language, it's Patagonia to not the Yukon. Um, what that means for the imagined Canadian right, is that a blackness is always foreign. It's someone else's issue. Um, two, uh, there's there's always this imagined black people came here because it's better than where they came from. Be that the United States and, and the underground the underground railroad, right? Be that um, everyone knows. I don't know how we can integrate the ways in which enslavement is key to the Canadian story, key to Canadian nation building. It is the imagined and constructed other, the normative Canadian whiteness, which must be supreme because Black people choose to be here in the imagined Canadian consciousness without getting to the very bottom of how dare we as Canadians, we're not Americans. I know I didn't answer the question, but those are my thoughts. And with the last bit of time, um, Arts Council would like to pose a, a question. So on behalf of Arts Council, what does meaningful and powerful mentorship for young emerging black creatives, artists, and thinkers feel and look like to you? I think that feels like a great note to kind of finish up on. So please feel welcome to share. I'm gonna jump in because I am still in that age category where everyone loves to mentor us. Um, you know, Carl James wrote about this and essentially to summarize his writing, he said, what the fuck is with this mentorship shit? Why are we still doing it? Right? Like the notions of mentorship is, is inherently hier uh, hierarchical, um, you know, it under, in certain ways it like, and I, and I say this, especially grounding myself in experience of black child welfare survivorship. Um, everyone loves to mentor us. Holy fuck. Um, and you know, one of the things that I say is I know people struggle with me, particularly in this child welfare industry, and I call it that for a reason, because we're never understood as the colleague, we're never understood as the professional, we're never understood as the, as the, as the expert, actually. Um, and so in these notions of mentorship, are they often actually enchain particularly young Black people as like almost empty vessels or kind of like people who need to be emotionally managed or taught better, right? And that's like, I have many and multiple intergenerational relationships. At most, I call these relationships guides because these people are also comrades. So in some ways, these folks learn things from me, right? Um, and so I think for folks who want to work with, you know, because we were saying, you know, mentoring, mentoring, you know, Black folks, it, you know, and young Black folks, it's understanding that they're often coming to the table with something that likely in your generation, you didn't even see from your vantage point. Like the reality is, is particularly the Black US does not want to admit that a lot of the vernacular that they're using right now is coming particularly from a, from a Black, from Black Canadian-ness, right? And like, and the areas in which uh, like, for example, like Brampton and Scarborough, right? And that because Drake teethed it and then everyone loves Drake, the way that circulated. Black youth culture offers something very, something very substantial. Um, and so stop, I would say, if you want to have genuine relationships with young Black people, we can tell when we're being social worked often. We can tell when we're being talked down to. 
And we can tell that there's these kind of like weird assertions of like, you know, position or age that are not responsive to the conversation, whether it's request for accountability or request for support or, or, or a request for knowledge. Like I was talking to a young black woman out at U Ottawa, black lawyer, young black lawyer. And she told her quote unquote mentor, black man, no, with respect to, she didn't want support from him. Right. She said no to something. And then suddenly that completely impacted their quote unquote mentorship, mentorship relationship. Right. And so it really showed the dynamic there. Um, and when I talked to her about it, it was because he didn't understand you as, 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 as in your position to be able to assert yourself. And I think that is a thing is when you work with young people, young black people, particularly, do you actually understand that they can say no and assert their own knowledge and assert themselves and yes, still learn from your creativity and your experiences and your expertise, but understanding that they have their own because when we talk about policing, we're talking about them being policed, right? And so while a bunch of us are getting, you know, dollars and grants off of research around these issues around carcerality, we're doing that because someone else is actually experiencing. And so I think that's, an, and again, another ethical kind of reckoning ethical thing. I don't know if Pamucha wants to speak to this because um, I might not do as good of a job, um, but to, to Josh's point about really problematizing the idea of mentorship, to what extent is mentorship as a construct just a tool through which we replicate white supremacy? So we're let, I'll go. <laughs> Can you be, I, I'm like, she, she speaks strongly to this, right? Go ahead, like, Natalie. Mm, okay. Uh, here's the thing. So we talk about how young people of color broadly and black young people specifically, right? There's, there's racial achievement gaps. So what are we going to do? Right. And they just, right. They, they, they can't flourish in the predominantly white institution. The predominantly white institution is just grinding us down, right? It's inherently violent, it's inherently supremacist. So the way that we're going to do it is we're going to teach, right? The um, black people that have somehow managed to survive this onslaught right? to teach other black people who are behind them in, in the life course of the professional course, all the ways that they've dodged the bullets right? and somehow managed to survive a white supremacist system without ever changing or fundamentally even questioning that system. And then we're gonna call it mentorship. That will give us the additional bonus of allowing us to blame them for not having enough of it. And that's why they're failing in these systems, right? Um, I have had the process of grooming explained to me and I have had the process of mentorship explained to me and I'm unable to separate mm -hmm. what that is in practice. Right? And I'm, I'm no longer a mentor, right? Because I, I can't right, teach other younger people that look like me how to put up with the things that I've put up with. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, period. Mentorship. Well, we have hit 8 p.m. and the panel has come to a close. <clears throat> Apologies. In terms of clo closing thoughts and feelings, um, as I mentioned before, saying thank, thank you is not a true extension of the gratitude that we feel for sharing this space and kind of building together in conversation. And that we also appreciate the further hosting of this video on the Arts Council website for Black History Month. Of course, um, presenting a video only for Black History Month is not enough. And that that material is kind of put to a limit in a lot of those cases. Um, thank you again for joining us and for sharing your amazing thoughts and perspectives. And I look forward to following up with you again um, in the future. We can definitely take a look at the chat and see all of the wonderful exclamation points and comments from folks that have joined us today. And uh, Caitlin, would you like to close out the panel? Thank you again, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be moderator. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to all the participants for joining us, uh, to our panelists and Talisha, this was incredible.
This is awesome. I was just sitting here with my camera off, listening and uh, taking it all in. That was amazing. On behalf of the Arts Council, truly, thank you so much. Um, I hope we can leave this discussion up on our website past Black History Month. I feel like it should be up beyond that, absolutely. Um, and just one little extra thank you on behalf of the Arts Council, Talisha. We wanted to publicly thank you for your time and your dedication to the Arts Council um, over the last couple of years. And we wish you the best with your future endeavors. So that's from everybody at Arts Council and on the board. Uh, again, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. The video will hopefully be posted in you know, the next day or so. And I hope everybody has a great night. Stay safe, stay healthy. And we hope to see you um, at future discussions or future events coming up. So thank you, everybody.